All right, so welcome to Math 355 Lecture 2, Abstract Algebra. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about proof techniques in great detail. And I'm going to emphasize you know, certain techniques. In particular, we'll see more techniques as the semester progresses. We will start off by doing a little bit of terminology. You just have to know language. You have to know how to refer to things. But I really want to focus on proofs by induction. How many of you have never seen proofs by induction before? Okay, good. So everybody has at least seen proofs by induction a little bit. That's why for the lecture today, I've actually just taken some slides from other talks I've given and just pasted them there so that um, you have you know, all the details for the induction and I don't have to spend the time writing it up today because I'm assuming it's a review, but it's a review that I really want to do and I want to emphasize how do you look at these things. It is often very easy to follow a proof, but it's very difficult to create your own proof. And in this class, we really want to talk about the mindsets of how do you come up with things. There are a couple of questions where the answers are for the most part straightforward, but every now and then students give me a really strange answer. So just think a little bit before. You have a baby that's crying, you're a new parent, what do you do? Baby is crying, you're a new parent, what do you do? Feed it, good, that's a good answer. What else could you try to do? Lock it, excellent, another good answer. Any other good answers? Burp it, change the diaper, right? Lots of things you can do. Shoot it, sadly has been suggested as an answer that should not be anywhere on the list. So you try all these things. And when the baby is young and you are a new parent, you don't necessarily know which one is going to work. But after a while, you start to recognize the, this is I'm hungry cry. This is I want to be held cry. And then you can say, ah, okay, let me try this first. Proof writing is a lot like that, is you want to try to figure out which key things in the problem highlight what you should be doing. If you are taking a textbook, it is so beautifully organized, right? Well, gee, I wonder what I should use for homework from the section on the chain rule. I wonder if maybe the chain rule would be useful, right? There's no surprise. It's much harder when you're trying to create things. So the book is often misleading. You don't see the thought process behind how did we get here? How do we think to try to do this? Uh, I'm gonna end class today with trying to sniff out what you should try to prove. And so we'll talk a little bit about that when you don't know what you're trying to prove, how do you come up with what's a good candidate to try? All right, so let's do a little bit of notation. Uh, so the first is one-to-one -one or onto. So we say, whoa, way too big. So we say F is one-to-one -one or injective if F of X equals F of Y implies X equals Y. So if you have the same output, you must be the same input. What about the other direction? If you're the same input, do you have the same output? You're, if x equals y, does f of x equal f of y? Yeah, right? You know, f of five is f of five. It's really not that big of a deal, right? We, say, we could say f is one to one if and only if I f f f of x equals um, okay. Okay, f of x equals f of y if and only if x equals y. So I f f is a really useful phrase if and only if. A lot of times, but not always, one direction is trivial. Yeah. If x equals y, f of x equals f of y, that's not hard to prove. For other functions, it might be very hard to prove that the only time the outputs are the same is when the inputs are the same. So the next one is we say f is onto or surjective if for all b in b, there is an A in A such that F of A equals B 
where f is going to be some function from, let's say, some set A to some set B. So subjective or onto means you give me anything in the output space, and I can find something in the input space that goes there. So notation, we frequently use the upside down A to mean for all, and the flip E to be to exist. This is just a more compact way of writing things down. You know, in the beginning of the semester, I'm going to write everything out the long way, but eventually we'll start you know, shifting to notation like this. Give me any value of y other than zero, there are two values of x that will be mapped to that value of y under the squaring function. So, yes. Well, one to one is the same as injective. Oh, I mean, I've seen it as referring to bijective, but should I just scratch that? So, bijective is not the same as one to one. So, bijective by means two, you know, by plane two wings. Uh, you have to have two things that are true it has to be injective and it has to be surjective, or it has to be one to one and onto. You can even mix and match. You can do injective and onto if you want to do one from each. But injective is not the same as bijective. Now, what frequently, what you might be thinking of is the following. A function that is not is injective but not surjective is bijective onto its image. So if you throw away the extra point, so if I view this function as a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, it's it's not. Or I could view it as, I could view it, for example, as you know, f of x equals x squared. Let's say f is from 0 infinity to minus infinity infinity. This is not by not uh, subjective. But is if we restrict output to 0 infinity. So this might be what you're thinking of, is a lot of times I could have an injective function but it doesn't hit all the output space. So instead of looking at your output space as what I initially told you, correct it and say, let's just look at the image of f, the points that are held. So an injective function is bijective if you restrict the range to just the image, if that makes any sense. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is just uh, equivalence notation. So we say a relation order is reflexive if x is related to x. It's symmetric if x is related to y. And it's transitive if x is related to y, y is related to z implies x is related to z. So if these three things hold, a relationship is called an equivalence. Can anybody give me an example of an equivalence? It can be a stupid, trivial example. That should always be your go-to. A stupid example of an equivalence relation. So if all three hold, it's an equivalence. So can somebody give me an example? Yeah, the normal equal sign, right? So this is in some sense a generalization of equality. So if two things, you know, is x equal to x? Yes. If x equals y, does y equal to x? Yes. Okay. Can somebody give me a non-trivial example? So what would be a non-trivial example? 
We did this actually yesterday. And by yesterday, I always mean whatever the previous class was. Tomorrow is always whatever the next class was. Yeah, clock arithmetic. That's a great example of an equivalence. You know, it's basically 10 o'clock now in five hours, it's three. So on a clock with 12 hours, 15 and three are indistinguishable. What about, say, less than? Would less than be an equivalence? What do you think? Does it satisfy the three properties? Which one does it feel? Okay, so it feels reflexive. So let's make it less than or equal to. Does it pass reflexive now? So it's reflexive. So, so is it an equivalence now? Is it transitive? Yes. So all comes down to symmetric. If X is less than Y, does Y have to be less than or equal to X? No, right. So it's possible that some of the properties might hold, but not all of them. So it's always good to see, you know, do I really have to worry about all three properties? You know, we saw that in the first day of class when we were looking at some of these alphabet codes that we could sometimes be a little bit more concise. We don't need all of them, we just need some of them. You know, here we need all three of them. It's possible to have a relation that's reflexive and transitive, but not symmetric, or we could even have one that is transitive, but not reflexive or symmetric. And the whole idea is that for a lot of problems, we only care about certain features. And so if two things are equivalent, they are the same for the thing we care about. Okay. So this is just notation. So for the next part is I wanna talk about proofs by induction. And as examples, I will do sums of powers. And I've actually just written um, a paper with uh, some students about some ways of proving some of these results. If any of you are interested, I will try to provide opportunities if you wanna do some non-standard writing instead of some homework problems, that's definitely an option. So the idea is we have some statement PN. Maybe, Pn is the sum of the first n integers is n times n plus one over two. Now, when we count, what do you want to start counting with? What number? I, I, I see a vote for one. Sometimes it's convenient to start with zero. Sometimes it's convenient to start with one. When my son was very small and I told him, okay, we can do this three more times and we have to move on. He realized, daddy's a mathematician. I'm going to count zero, one, two, three. And you know, he knew I would smile enough that oh, I finally will do it four times. I, sometimes it's better to start with zero. Sometimes it's better to start with one. It's usually not a big deal. Just be careful. Any CS people here? Anybody coding? Okay. Sometimes in different environments, they start their index set with either zero or one. And you have to be very careful. And you just always want to be aware of the notation. So maybe PN is the statement, you know, one plus two plus dot, 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 plus N is N, N plus one over two. And we want to prove that. Well, the first thing we can do is we can try to get a sense of, is this true? We can put in lots of different values of n. And hopefully, every time we put in a value of n, it will work. And we start to gain more and more confidence. But we saw last time with the 16 over 64 and so on, that something can work for a while and then fail. You know, I know a beautiful statement that works for the first you know, 40 or so numbers and then breaks down. And so it can be a while before you see that new behavior. And so we want to try to find a way to prove this. And so the more n I do, the more confident I might become, but that's not a proof. Induction allows us to prove things for all n. And it's going to be a nice procedure. Now, this does not mean that induction is the only way to prove things. Sometimes there is a more direct proof or another proof that works. Does anybody here know the story of Douse and the summing? Okay, so I see uh, one person has heard. So the story allegedly is that when Gauss was very young, like five, he was in class and the teacher was just having one of those days and just couldn't deal with the brats. 
I'm sorry, the young scholars, young scholars. And so to get some emotional alone time, the teacher said, I want you to add up the numbers from one to a hundred. And you know, with five year olds, that should take a while. And Gauss immediately goes, you know, 5,050. And so the question is, how did Gauss get this so quickly? Well, let's let Sn be one plus two plus dot, 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 plus n minus one plus n. And of course, if I write the numbers in reverse order, does it change the sum? No. And now we just add. So twice the sum is going to be n plus one plus n plus one plus n plus one plus n plus one. And we have n plus one, a total of n times. Therefore, the sum is n, n plus one over two. And there's the proof. Now, if all I care about is proving the sum of the first n integers, this is a great proof. But if I now say, okay, Gauss, sum the squares of the first hundred numbers. This proof no longer works, it breaks down. As a nice exercise, you know, if you want for extra credit and maybe even a paper, try to see, can you somehow take Gauss's brilliant insight and make it work for sums of squares? And you can use as an input that we know what this sum is. Can you somehow use that to get sums of squares? But immediately it doesn't seem to generalize because one plus n is always gonna be n plus one, but one squared plus n squared is not the same as two squared plus n minus two squared. So there's a difficulty there. So frequently you can come up with a proof that's very specific and very tailored for what you're looking at, but it may not generalize to other things. It's good to have broad techniques that can apply in many situations. So again, we've talked about how we have to be careful just because something works for a while doesn't mean it's always going to work. And so I didn't realize this, but uh, when I wrote things up in PowerPoint and then transferred it to the iPad, it seems to have shifted some of the fonts a little bit. I noticed this in the first section. Um, the good news about being the second section is now I know precisely where the really bad typos are going to be. All right, so here is how proof by induction works. We have some statement PN, and we have two things we have to do. We have to show that P1 is true, or maybe P0, depending on how we count. So we show P1 is true. And then we have to show that whenever Pn is true, Pn plus one is true. If we can do this, then we get to conclude that Pn is true for all n. Now, I am not saying that we are proving directly that Pn is true. I'm saying when we're trying to show Pn plus one is true, we get to assume Pn is true. And then once we have that, we then show Pn plus one is true. Okay, so we call the first step the base case. We call the second step the inductive step. Now, why does this work? Why does this show that it's going to hold for all values of n? Well, let's take n equals one. We know p1 is true. And if we take the inductive step, if we put in n equals one, we know whenever pn is true, pn plus one is true. So whenever p1 is true, p2 is true. So p1 true implies that p2 is true. But we directly prove that P1 is true. So now we know that P2 is true. Now what value should we take for N? Two, right? And so now we take N equals two, and now we go P2 is true. P2 is true implies P3 is true. So P3 is true. Now what do we take for N? Three, right? And so um, how much? Class time do I have to fill up? Okay, so at this point, you know, it should be pretty clear. We just keep marching down and down, okay? Once we've done this, we're done. And now we can get that PN is true for any N. And this is often viewed as a staircase. So we start off with P1, and then we show P1 implies P2, so therefore P2 is true. P2 implies P3, so P3 is true, and so on and so on and so on. They sometimes use the image of a domino. The first one knocks down, the second knocks down, the third knocks down, the fourth and so on and so on and so on. So we just have to show two things. So let's imagine um, that we wanna show this for the sum of the integers. The sum of the first n integers is n, n plus one over two. So first we have to show P1 is true, then we have to show the inductive step. Frequently, the base case is trivial. 
hmm, does one equal one times one plus one over two? You know, after doing some algebra, and that is in the name of this class, right? We see that one equals one. Good. The base case is true. We do not have to check anything else. But you know, if we wanted to, we could check n equals two and n equals three just to get some intuition. And maybe if the statement is false, maybe we'll catch it before we spend a lot of time trying to prove Pn implies Pn plus one. In this case, when we check n equals two or three, the algebra is pretty straightforward and we see that yes, it's true. And we're beginning to get a little bit more confident that we might have this formula. We're actually very confident because we've already seen a proof of it, but we can now try to prove this by induction. And so when we're trying to prove it by induction, we get to assume the sum of one through n is n, n plus one over two. We want to now study the sum of one to n plus one. So the idea in many of these proofs is somehow you want to see Pn lurking inside Pn plus one. So can anybody tell me where is something related to Pn in Pn plus one? So can you see anywhere in the sum of one plus two plus three, all the way up to n plus one, can you see anything related to Pn? Yeah, everything but the final, the sum of the first n, by induction, we know that that's n, n plus one over two. So we can take out the sum of the first n terms and put that in, and then we just have to show that that resulting sum is n plus one, n plus one plus one over two. Okay, so we notice that we have that, and we know that it equals n, n plus one over two. So we can plug that in, we can substitute that in over here. And when we do that, um, we get n, n plus one over two plus n plus one. So how do we add two fractions? So how would you add two fractions? Anybody remember from algebra two or algebra one? What do you do? Yeah, you get common denominators. So we would multiply the second one by two over two. And so when we add that, we multiply by two over two, so we get two n plus one over two. Notice that they both have an n plus one, and so you get n plus two. Um, and we just factor it out. And then because I know I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get, I know that I should view n plus two as n plus one plus one. And that proves the result. So the key idea is just to use common denominators. It's not that bad to do this. Okay. Imagine now I gave you the sum of squares. And as long as we're imagining things, let's imagine you have a nice professor who cares about you and tells you that it's n, n plus one, two, n plus one over six. If I tell you what it equals, then the induction is trivial. It's just roll up your sleeves and do some algebra. If I don't tell you what the formula is, it's much harder. How many points determine a line? Two. How many points determine a quadratic? Three. And a cubic is four. So when we summed the first powers, we actually got a quadratic in n. I'm claiming here that when we sum the squares, we get a cubic. If you sum the fourth powers, you would get a polynomial degree five. What you could do is, if you believe that it's a polynomial, by doing what's called interpolation, you could write down the sum for a couple of values of n, figure what is the only polynomial of the correct degree that passes through those values, and then do the induction. So there are ways to sniff this out. There's lots of things you can do. For now, I will be nice. I will tell you what it should be. And then the proof is essentially the same as before. You know, we check the base case and make sure the base case works. It does, no problem. And now we start to just um, add everything. And this is where, unfortunately, there are some typos. Um, it doesn't like, for some reason, it didn't keep the superscripts. So I use the inductive assumption to replace the sum of the first n squares with n, n plus one, two, n plus one over six. And then when I do the algebra, and again, apologies that it dropped all the squares. Uh, when the dust settles, everything equals what it's supposed to equal. Okay. And so again, you could figure out formulas for sums of cubes and so on and so on and so on. If I tell you what it should be, it's not so bad. Okay, here's a fun one. Let's look at the sum of the first n odd numbers. 
And I'm choosing to write the last numbers two n minus one, not two n plus one, because if n equals one, then two n minus one is one. If n equals two, two n minus one is three. It just normalizes things nicely so that the sum of the first n odd numbers goes up to two n minus one. And the claim is the sum of the first n odd numbers is just n squared. So again, we do the base case and then the inductive stuff. The base case is trivial. You know, does one equal one squared? Yes. You know, we could do the other cases if we wanted to, to just build some intuition. We could check n equals two, we could check n equals three. And then the rest of the proof is similar to what you've done before. So as a nice exercise, you know, try to go through and write up the proof of uh, this statement by induction. What I will be doing is I will be having a slight shift between when homework is assigned and when it's due so that we've covered the material with plenty of time. So you have plenty of time to talk to me and talk to the TA. So I do not encourage you to wait to the last minute because we'll already be on new material, but the homework will be due significantly after we cover the material. So you have plenty of time to talk with each other and talk with the TAs. There's more than one way to prove things. And so rather than proving this by induction, it's actually better to prove it geometrically. When you see that the answer is n squared, it's, hmm, I wonder, is there something special going on with n squared? What does that represent? Well, n squared geometrically is just a square. And so let's look at the sum of the odd numbers. If I have just one odd number, okay, it's so a one by one square, essentially. If I have one plus three, I can take my one and then I can put three dots around it to make it a larger square. And if you think about it, how much do I have to extend? You know, I have one going down, one going over, and I have to put one in the corner. So I go from one dot to three dots. To continue to get the next square, I have to add five dots. I take the longest side two and go down. I take the longest column two and go over. That's another two. And then I have to put one in the corner. And so as a nice exercise, try to make this rigorous, that when we have this geometric argument, that this will also prove that the sum of the first n odd numbers is just n squared. For more interesting proof by induction, 133 turns out always divides 11 to the n plus one plus 12 to the two n minus one. Okay, this is a little bit different than some of the others. Uh, please look away for a second. Do not look at the screen. I am just doing this so that, if, okay. You can look again. That way, you could pause the YouTube video and it was displayed. It's also in the slides, but try to do that without looking at the answer. Try to prove that 133 always divides that expression. You can prove it by induction, but it's a little bit different than the inductions we've done before. The last thing I want to do, as long as we're talking about these sums, is you were, we were fortunate in that we were able to find the answers. And we had an exact closed form expression. What if we can't get the answer? Can we get at least an upper bound and a lower bound and get a sense of the behavior? So let's imagine we have one plus two plus dot, 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 plus n. I don't care how bad it is. Can somebody give me a low bound? The worst low bound you can think of for this sum. Okay, nope, that's too good of a low bound. So keep that in reserve. That's a good lower bound. Zero. That is the worst lower bound possible thing. We at least know it's not negative. And then you can improve zero to what? One. And one is the smallest number in the sequence. And now we can use the result. What about an upper bound? Can someone give me an upper bound? So we have a lower bound of size n. What would an upper bound be? N squared, excellent. So this is less than equal to N times N. This is the number of summons. And this is the largest value. And unfortunately, the lower bound and the upper bound are of completely different orders of magnitude. One is of size N, one is of size N squared. So I don't know the true size of this sum. Now, when you look at what we have, I wrote n, n plus one over two as n squared over two plus n over two. So you can see, oh, there is a term of size n squared, there is a term of size n. Which is the term that dominates for large n? The n squared over two or the n over two? 
Yeah, I mean, imagine going up to Elon Musk and or you know Jeff Bezos or Bill and Melinda Gates. Like, I'm really sorry, we made a mistake. There's ten thousand dollars less in your bank account than we thought. <laughs> yeah, this is at the order of square root of what their assets. Are. This is nothing. This is not noticeable, right? When n is very very large, n over two is insignificant relative to n squared. So this is roughly of size n squared or n squared over two. Here's a better lower bound. So one plus two plus dot 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 plus n is greater than or equal to n halves plus dot 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 plus n. And again, maybe it's n minus one over two or n plus one over two. I don't really care. It's you know, looking at the last half, last half of sums. How many terms do we have? So basically, how many terms do we have in the sum? What would we get? Or what's the, or what's the smallest value in the sum? And over two. And how many terms approximately do we have? And over two. And again, maybe it's a little bit off. Maybe it's n over two minus one, whatever. But this is basically n squared over four. Ah, this now tells us the lower bound is of size n squared over four. The upper bound is of size n squared. Okay, it's roughly of size n squared. We've been able to sniff out the independence. So even if you're not able to solve the problem exactly, you can often get a feel or a flavor for the answer. And that's a very valuable skill to get. I'm gonna skip the upper bound stuff. Uh, let's see what's on powers, okay. So before we do the next one, I am going to prove that everybody in this classroom has the same name. I need a volunteer and you have to have a valid identification on you. Williams ID, license, passport. Does anybody have a valid ID that they're willing to use? All right, you've got one? I'll accept a Williams ID. If I don't, given that I'm employed by Williams, that could cause trouble. All right. All right, I'm going to prove everybody's named Yana. Does anybody have any concern about my attempt to prove that everybody has the same name? Are you also gonna prove that your name is Yana? Yes. <laughs> Don't you think I'm a person? If you prick me, do I not bleed? Wrong me, shall I not avenge? Who's that from? This is a liberal arts college. You should know stuff like this. Shakespeare uh, or Star Trek VI, because the Klingons like to quote Shakespeare and Star Trek VI. All right. I'm going to prove everybody has the same name. Um, I want to say Merchant of Venice. I'm not sure if both of them are from Merchant of Venice. I think they both are from Shylock. Um, if you prick us, do we not bleed? Long us, shall we not avenge? Pretty sure. Okay, so the following is my statement PN. In any group of N people, everyone has the same name. Now, I'm not saying that if there are two different groups of N people that they have the same name. I'm just saying whenever you have N people together, they all have the same name. And I'm going to show two things. I'm going to show the base case when N equals one, everybody in the group has the same name. And then I'm going to show that if PN is true, then PN plus one is true. So let's do the base case first. Does everyone agree that the base case is true? That if you have a group with just one person, everybody in the group has the same name? This is really not that hard. All right, so we're comfortable with the base case. So the base case is immediate as there's only one person in the group. So clearly everyone in the group has the same name. All right, let's turn to the more interesting case, the inductive stuff. So these are beautiful uh, images of stick figures that I was able to find online. And so it somehow changed the size of the image. I don't know why. So I am going to show that under the assumption that any group of n people have the same name, that if you had a group of n plus one people, they would all have the same name as well. So I have my beautiful stick figures labeled one through n plus one. Can somebody give me a group of n people among these n plus one people? 
Give me a procedure for choosing n people. How can I get n people? First n, excellent choice, right? So I, I was already starting to resize it. Take the first n. That's a good group of n people. They all have the same name. Can someone give me another group of n people? Somebody other than Yana, someone else, come on. I'm sorry, who, who, who's speaking? Which Yana's speaking? The final N. Yes, the final N would also work. And in the group of the last N people, they all have the same name, right? But if you look now, the first N people all have the same name. The last N people all have the same name. So everybody has the same name as persons two, three, four, up to N, because they're in both groups. So everybody in the first group has the same name as person two. Everybody in the last group has the same name as person two. So everybody has the same name. And since we've already established one person is named Yana, everyone in the world. Fortunately, it turns out last names can be distinct. So we do have a way of distinguishing people. It's only the first names. What's wrong with this proof? It feels on two, excellent. So you're, it looks like everything is good. It looks like everybody has the same name. But if we look a little bit more closely, when n equals one, the first group, we have two people now, n plus one is two. The first group is just person one. The second group is just person two. There is no overlap. If you think about what's going on, we have a broken staircase. We don't have P1 implies P2. If we knew that in every group of two people you had the same name, then yes. But if you have three people, two has the same name as one, three has the same name as one. So three, one, and two all have the same name. It's amazing how many things you can prove with a broken staircase. I can prove every integer is a square of another integer with a similar argument like this. Okay, that's what goes wrong, is that we do not know it's true for n equals two. Unfortunately, when you look at stuff like this, when you draw things, you often try to draw a generic n. But when I drew this, I accidentally did not draw a generic n. I drew an n that was large, like three or two even. You know, this does not include the case when n equals one. You've got to be very careful about stuff like that. All right. So that finishes induction. I want to now go to Pascal's triangle and talk about other ways of proving things. So has everybody here seen Pascal's triangle? Okay, excellent. So Pascal's triangle, it's ones along the two diagonals, and then each number is the sum of the number above to the left plus above to the right. And these numbers come from expanding x plus y to the n. So everything raised to the zero is equal to one, except for one number. What's the one number to the zero that may not be one? Yeah, zero to the zero may not be one. That's tricky. But anything else to the zero is one. So x plus y to the zero is one. x plus y to the first is just one x plus one y. That's why those are in red. x plus y squared is one x squared plus two xy plus one y squared, and so on and so on and so on. So frequently, there's many ways of defining things. And it's not necessarily clear which definition is best. So I can define Pascal's triangle as the numbers that arise when we expand x plus y to the n. And the nth row is just whatever those coefficients are. The first row of Pascal's triangle is actually the zeroth row, because it's coming from x plus y to the zero. So again, depending on how you want to do things, I could say there are three rows, the zeroth row, the first row, and the second row. OK, if you look at this, you can see numbers like 10 is equal to 4 plus 6 or 6 plus 4. But there's a lot more identities. Uh, can somebody tell me what is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4? Which is the number immediately one row further down and to the right? What's 1 plus 4 plus 10 plus 20? 35, which is one word. So that's the hockey stick identity. You can see Fibonacci numbers in here. There's a lot of stuff hidden in Pascal's triangle. OK, so the big one that we're going to try to prove is you know, Pascal's identity. Each number is the sum of the number above to the left plus above to the right. We'll give several proofs of this because it's so important. So here, 
let's just do a special case and doing this special case is enough to show you how to do the direct brute force approach. Let's look at x plus y to the fifth and we'll expand it out. We'll get x to the fifth plus five, x to the fourth, y, and so on and so on and so on. And now let's calculate x plus y to the sixth. So to do that, well, x plus y to the sixth is just x plus y times x plus y to the fifth. And now I just use the distributive property. That's x times x plus y to the fifth plus y times x plus y to the fifth. And you can see why I chose to just have this as a slide that I could display rather than writing all of this down. I now expand x plus y to the fifth, and I'm being very careful as to how I write them so that I can align things with the same powers. And when you can see what goes on and I add them, ah, I'm gonna get x to the sixth plus five plus one x to the fifth y plus 10 plus five x to the fourth y squared. You can see the summing coming from above to the left and above to the right. I did this for x plus y to the fifth. We could do this more generally. I could look at x plus y to the n, and let's say that's the sum of a n k x to the k y to the n minus k, k goes from zero to n. And then x plus y to the n plus one would be the sum, um, let's say l goes from zero to n plus one, of a n plus one l x to the l y to the n plus one minus l. And that would also be x plus y times the sum k goes from zero to n of a n k x to the k y to the n minus k. And when you do all the grouping and whatnot, you can then get the relationships for the a's. And I'm just writing the you know, k thing in the nth row as a n k. Now we actually have formulas for what these are and we'll see what those formulas are in a moment, but this is a way to just formally work with things and prove Pascal's identity. Now, when I do this, I don't actually know what the a n k's are, but that's fine. All right, so here is you know, Pascal's triangle. And it turns out that there is a really nice formula for each entry. So can anybody tell me what is the formula Number of combinations, excellent. And so what we can do here is, you know, n choose k is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. It's the number of ways to choose k objects from n when order does not matter. So it turns out that these are the entries of Pascal's uh, triangle. Initially, it doesn't look like this might be an integer because you have division, but everything works out. Okay, so we're going to prove the binomial theorem. So we're going to prove that n choose k plus n choose k plus one is n plus one choose k plus one. And that's Pascal's formula. Okay. So the first is um, the fact that these come in. If I give you x plus y to the n, this is x plus y times x plus y dot dot, dot times x plus y. So I have n factors. For each factor, I either choose an x or a y. What's the highest power of x I could get? x to the n, I choose x every single time. What's the highest power of y I could get? y to the n. If n equals 10 and I choose x three times, so how many times would I have to choose y if I choose x three times, if n equals 10? Seven. I know it has to look like this. X's, I had to choose n minus k y's. And now I have n factors. How many ways are there to choose k of the n factors to be x? That is just n choose k. That's our definition of the binomial coefficient. So this is a nice way to see 
Pascal's identity by just thinking about what am I doing? What do I do when I expand? For each fact, I either choose X or I choose Y. Okay. Now I want to prove Pascal's formula. So here is the first possible proof. This is either a really good or a really bad way of doing things. It works, but it's not necessarily pleasant. For a lot of things in life, step one is make sure you can do it. Then if you can do it, worry about doing it well, doing it efficiently, but just first make sure you can get it done. Here is the brute force approach. All right. I have n choose k is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. n choose k plus 1 is n factorial over k plus 1 factorial n minus k plus 1 factorial versus n plus 1 factorial over k plus 1 factorial n minus k factorial, because the plus one's the answer. What do I do now? I claim these are equal. What can I do? Any thoughts? Yeah, common denominator or even better, clear denominators. Now, this class is abstract algebra, not tedious algebra, right? But you know, if I just multiply by the common denominator, which would be like k plus 1 factorial n minus k factorial, and then simplify things, I will get the identity. So this is one way to prove it. And you know, now we know the result is true. But we don't have any idea of why it's true. It's just we did some algebra. And at the end of the day, when the dust settled, we had the relationship, but I don't necessarily know why it's true. And so the question is, can we come up with a better proof that will give us a sense of why it's true? So I need an awesome tool. It's a proof by story. N to K N to K plus one is N plus one to K plus one. I need an awesome tool. Have we know a good school? Thank you. All right, this is enough out, right? So imagine you have n students from the least. Give me a lesser school. Amherst. We have one student. Amherst. We have n plus one students. And one choose K plus one students. These are there to choose K plus one students from N plus one students. So, how many ways can I choose K plus one students from N plus one students? N plus one, choose K plus one. I have N plus one students. I choose K plus one of them. So a lot of mathematics comes down to doing something two different ways. And so I'm trying to tell a story. And so let's try to figure out, is there another way to do this? Well, I have two cases. I either have the Amherst student, or I do not have the Amherst student. So if I have the Amherst student, I have to choose them. There's one Amherst student, so it's one choose one. Now, there are N students from Williams. How many students from Williams must I choose? I have to choose K. Or I could be in a much better situation where I don't have the Amherst student. How many Williams students do I need now? And plus one. I'm sorry. I uh, k plus one. Sorry, k plus one. Oops, somehow change the color on me. Uh, 
And there we go. And there is Pascal's identity. So what does one choose one and one choose zero equal? They equal one. That's why we don't bother writing them. That's why we write it as n choose k and n choose k plus one. It's really one choose one n choose k. And when you write it like that, notice the tops always add up to n plus one. The bottoms always add up to k plus one. We have n plus one objects. We have k plus one choices. We don't write factors of one, but when we do this, I think it makes the formulas harder to understand where they're coming from. We, we hide what's going on. You know, n choose k plus, n choose k plus one, what's going on? It's much cleaner to see it like this uh, when we write it this way as to what's going on. And so this is a proof by story. This is one of the hardest proof techniques there is, is you have to find two different ways to count something. But if you're able to do that, it's incredibly powerful. Okay, uh, just because it's such a wonderful topic, um, just to show you a little bit more of what's lurking beneath the surface for Pascal's triangle. We've talked about clock arithmetic before. We've normally done things in the real world with 12 hours. We will see later that clocks with a prime number of hours are really good. What's the simplest prime to study? Two. It's the only even number that's prime. And for the people who think that's amazing, and three is the only multiple of three that's prime, right? So what we're going to do is whenever a number in Pascal's triangle is odd, we'll put a dot. Whenever it's even, we'll remove the dot. So if we just have one row, it's a dot. If we have four rows, we've only removed one number, the two in the one, two, one. If we go a little bit further, we see a little bit more has been removed. Um, these slides are a little bit old. I eventually you know, redid it. But initially when I was doing things in Mathematica, it was easier to do things such that the triangle was rotated 90 degrees. And you could actually, I'll send you the link, you can actually play the link and it's going to keep adding more and more rows, but it's going to always adjust. And so no matter how many rows you have, it always shows it on the same size screen. And if you've seen anything with fractals, you can actually see a fractal structure emerging in Pascal's triangle. And it's not too bad to prove that there is a fractal structure. Uh, there's some you know, really interesting you know, questions and problems you can do with something like this. Okay. Any questions on what we've done up till now? Okay, everything is good. So we, we've reviewed proofs by induction. We've reviewed proofs by story. We've talked about how to calculate sums of powers. Uh, we've talked about how to estimate things. In general, we're not gonna be lucky enough to know what we're trying to prove. Now, again, if you're in a math class and section 3.2 is on the chain rule and I give you a homework problem, what should you use? Almost surely the chain rule, right? At least in the lower level classes, it's really hard to disguise what you're doing. Uh, what really bothers me is when students in multivariable calculus do not know to use spherical coordinates when you're integrating over a sphere. You know, I can't really hide that this is a spherical coordinate ball. You know, at least polar doesn't sound like a circle. You know, but you, know, you see a sphere, you should be thinking spherical coordinates. Maybe it's not going to work, but it should at least be something on your radar screen. When we were trying to prove the formulas for sums of squares and cubes and all these stuff, if I give you the formula, it's actually not that bad. You just take the first n terms, put in the conjectured relationship, and then just do some algebra to get everything to simplify. There are ways to sniff out what those formulas are. And so what I want to do for the last part of today's class is talk a little bit about how could you find formulas? How can you get a sense of what to try to prove? And again, when you read a book, the book is extremely well organized. The authors have thought long and hard about what order to present things. When you're doing original research, that's not necessarily going to be the case. It's not going to be clear what to try to prove sometimes or what techniques to use. And so you want to try to get a feel of what the answer might be. So imagine you are the supreme being. You have complete control. So you first create the heavens and the earth, and then you do all these different things. And then on some day, I don't know what day, you create calculus. And again, uh, no complaints to the powers that be, but if you were to create calculus, what would you choose the derivative of a product to be? 
If you were making calculus, what would the derivative of a product be for you? What would the derivative of a quotient be for you if you were creating calculus? A product of the derivatives. And what would the derivative of a quotient be? Quotient of the derivatives, right? And that would make life so much easier for calculus students and you would have many happy followers, right? The derivative of a product is not the product of the derivatives. The derivative of a quotient is not the quotient of the derivatives. It's a more involved formula. So the question is, where does the formula come from? Now, I can give you the standard calculus proof. You know, the standard calculus proof involves a very clever uh, incorporation of adding zero. And maybe if there's time at the end of today, I'll go through and I'll, I'll do that. Let's try to build intuition. So what I need is I need two functions, f and g, and I'll take some function h, which will be f of x, g of x. So I need two functions where I know their derivatives and I know the derivative of their product. So then I can test and try to sniff out what the product rule is. So can somebody give me a function that we can differentiate easily? What's an easy standard function that we can differentiate? X, and give me another one. X squared. So instead of doing X and X squared, I'm going to do X to the N and X to the M because that way I can do infinitely many examples all at once. I could do X and X squared, but let me see if I can do things in more general. And then the products X to the N plus M, oh good, that's of the same form. So I have a hope of maybe I can do something with this. What's F prime of X? See who remembers that calculus. And x to the n minus one times one. But we don't write one as we've talked about in this class, right? But there really is a times one there. It's dx dx, dx dx is one. We don't bother writing this, but if we had the chain rule, if we had um, say some function a of x to the n, it would be n a of x to the n minus one, a prime of x. All right, g prime of x, is going to be m x to the m minus one h prime of x is going to be n plus m x to the n plus m minus one. Now, I claim that f of x g of x prime should involve f, g, f prime, and g prime. Does it make sense that those should be the ingredients in the derivative of the product? You know, consider f of x or g of x equals one. Well, if f of x or g of x equals one, this reduces to just the standard problem. So if g of x equals one, then the derivative is just f prime of x. So clearly f prime is now playing a role. And I could write f prime of x, maybe it's f prime of x times one because it's just g of x. So it looks like f prime and g play a role by symmetry. Um, f and g prime should play a role. So it seems reasonable that somehow f G, F prime, and G prime should play a role in the product. Do you think F double prime is going to play a role? Probably not. You know, I'm only taking one derivative. So now the question is, can you find a way to get X to the N plus M minus one from F, G, F prime, and G prime? Are there any combinations that can give you the right power? So how could we get an x to the n plus n minus one from the expressions we have?
So are there any ways to combine F, G, F prime, and G prime to get X to the N plus M minus one? Good, F of X times G prime of X. Any other way? So right now I'm going to just, I'm not going to add them. I'm going to just say, these are the only combinations that give me an X to the N plus N minus one. Notice F of X times G of X does not work. It does not give me the right power. And then further, we note that F prime of X G of X plus F of X G prime of X equals F of X G of X prime. So this is evidence for the product rule. Okay. Calculus is a prerequisite for this class. We're not going to be doing much time with calculus. Why am I spending so much time in the first week of class on this? It's to get you into the mindset of how do we prove things. And one of the first things, which is not emphasized nearly enough in how do you prove things, is figuring out what should I try to prove? You know, if I am nice, and I'm not going to be nice for the whole semester, I'll tell you what to try to prove. But frequently, as you leave Williams, you're going to have to try to figure out what's going on. And you're going to have to come up with conjectures. And you're going to have to then try to figure out, is this true? And so looking at this, I believe that, you know, here are two families of functions, x to the n, x to the m. I have infinitely many choices of n and m that I can put in. And I see that f prime g plus f g prime is always equal to the derivative of f g. Is this a proof? No. Maybe the product rule is particularly nice if we happen to have polynomials. But for more general functions, this fails. So this is evidence. But it could just be that the product rule holds if your functions are nice, but it will not hold in general. So the idea was we were trying to build up some intuition. We were able to do so, but unfortunately, this is not a proof. So the question is, can we think of any other functions where we know the answer? And fortunately, uh, there is an option. We need to remember a little bit of trick for this. Let's put f of x to sine of x. Let's put g of x cosine of x. And then let's put h of x the f of x, g of x, the sine of x, plus sine of x. It is always dangerous to ask students if they remember trig identities. Does anybody know a nice way of rewriting sine of x, cosine of x? Almost. So if I write this as 1 half times 2 sine x, cosine of x, this is just now one half cosine of two x. So excellent. So we now have three trig functions. Okay. What's f prime of x? What's the derivative of sine of x? Cosine of x. This is only true if you work in radians. If you work in degrees, the derivative of sine is not cosine. This is one of the reasons why we do everything in radians. What's the derivative of cosine? What's the derivative of cosine of x? Minus sine of x. And the mnemonic I have come up with is you have to remember where does the minus sign go? It goes as minus sign. Okay, that's how you can remember which way it goes. You can also think about is the function increasing or decreasing? Cosine of x starts off at one and it's getting smaller as x increases. So because it's getting smaller, its derivative has to be negative. Since sine of x is positive in the first quadrant, then you know it's got to be a negative there. Now, what's the derivative of 1 half cosine 2x? It's 1 half. What's the derivative of cosine 2x? The derivative of cosine is sine. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not cosine. Sorry, I wrote the wrong thing. Sorry, my, my mistake. Uh, it should have been 1 half sine of 2x. And so the derivative is going to be one half derivative of sine is cosine 
And now we have to take the derivative of two x. What's the derivative of two x? Two. And so we just get cosine of two x. Okay, so now x prime of x g of x plus f of x g prime of x. That's going to be cosine x cosine x. And then f of x is sine of x, g prime is minus sine of x. We have cosine x, cosine x, minus sine of x, sine of x. Does anybody remember what cosine x, cosine x minus sine of x, sine of x is? Cosine, cosine 2x. If you had forgotten it equals cosine 2 of x, how could you tell me that it must be cosine 2x? Well, you know the product rule, right? And h of x is just f of x times g of x. And we just showed that the derivative of h of x is cosine of 2x. So because we know the product rule, we know that this has to simplify to the cosine of 2x. Here's an interesting question. Did we just prove the angle addition formula? Well, the battery is really draining fast right now. And this is why you always bring um, the Power cable just in case. Okay. So the question is, did we just prove the product rule? Well, the question is, did we have to use the double angle or the angle addition formula in proving the def in proving what the derivative of sine and cosine are? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. So you have to be very careful about circular arguments. But this is a nice non-trivial check. of the product rule. So the fact that this works should give you a little bit more confidence in the product rule than just looking at simple polynomials. It's still not a proof, but it should give you a little bit more faith that maybe we're on to something. So the last thing I want to do today is just as long as we're here, talk a little bit about one of the interesting generalizations of integers. So, so much of this course is going to be, let's take something we know, the integers, the rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers, and let's try to find generalizations of them that will have similar behavior, but maybe not every property will translate. So can somebody tell me a nice property about primes? Why do we like prime numbers? So they only have two factors, but who cares? I could look at numbers that have only three factors. What's nice about primes? Why do we care? So every now and then you get a theorem that has so much importance that they add the word fundamental to it. So you've seen the fundamental theorem of calculus. There's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Every number can be written uniquely as a product of primes if you write the primes in increasing order. I'm not going to get excited that I can write six as two times three and three times two. Right? Let's just standardize and do it two times three. So every number can be written uniquely as a product of primes. So let's say I give you this function, you know, cosine squared of x. Can anybody factor cosine squared of x as a product of simpler things? Yeah, cosine x times cosine x, right? But I can also write cosine squared of x as 1 minus sine squared of x. What is 1 minus sine squared? Can you factor that? Difference of squares. So this is 1 minus, or how would you factor it? 1 minus or 1 plus? Which would you do first? It doesn't matter, but you have a preference. I do minus, they did plus in the first section, but you know, that's the first section for you. So one minus sine x, one plus sine of x. Does cosine of x divide one minus sine of x? No. So what's interesting here is, you know, if we look at the space of functions, there's a lot of similarities with numbers, but 
things are a little bit stranger now. I have two distinct factorizations for the function cosine squared of x. I can write as cosine x times cosine of x. I can write as one minus sine of x, one plus sine of x. And so the big theme of the class is going to be taking what you've seen for numbers and seeing how can we generalize. All right, so this finishes you know, the review of chapter one. You know, I really wanted to spend a lecture on just proof techniques and getting into the sense of how do you attack problems like this, especially when you don't necessarily know what the answer is. What you do is you explore. You try to look at, are there any cases I know? You know what if I take g of x equals one? What if I take f of x equals g of x? What if I take them to be simple functions? And I think build up intuition. If anybody is interested in trying to hand at mathematical writing, I think this would make a really nice you know, service argument or service article on you know, how can you, you know, try to sniff out relationships. You know, what would the product rule be? Well, let's try to build some intuition by looking at some simple functions and getting an idea of what it could be. Now, as we go through the semester, there's going to be a lot of things you have to prove. My freshman year at Yale, I thought the greatest mathematician of the 20th century was this person named Rita because everything was left to read it to prove. Right? This is gonna be a little bit different than other courses where you're gonna be left with a lot of theorems to try to prove. And you know, again, um, there are professors who teach classes like this where they assign every single problem. Um, yeah, and that's all the students do for the semester. And they leave with a phenomenal understanding of algebra. Yeah. We're not gonna be able to do that. You have lives other than abstract algebra. The more problems you do, the easier it's going to be to do even more problems. And that's why I want to try to split the class so that we do some lectures as well as just doing lots of problems in class and just going through the thought process out loud. All right, so this is a good place to start for today.